Muy buenas noches, amados amigos, hermanos presentes. Good evening, beloved friends and brethren present. Moisés. Here in the auditorium, es Moisés. It is a great privilege for me to be with you en esta ocasión, on this occasion to share some moments of fellowship with you around de la de Dios the Word of God and His program pertaining este to this end time. Para lo cual, Leer For this reason, I would like to read en in Éxodo capítulo Exodus 3, chapter 3, verses 13 and on, where it says, y dijo Moisés a Dios, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three day journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor of the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. May God bless our souls with his word and allow us to understand it. You may please be seated. This passage speaks to us about the exodus that God is going to carry out. And before God carried out that exodus, we find that in the Old Testament, back in Genesis, God had already spoken about that exodus he would carry out when the people who would participate in that exodus did not exist on earth yet. They were not materialized on earth in human flesh yet. And therefore, the people who would be in that exodus did not exist here on earth. But God is already talking about that exodus here in Genesis when he spoke to the patriarch and prophet Abraham, the prophet of the dispensation of the promise who is the prophet of the fourth dispensation. Notice in chapter 15 of Genesis, verse 12 and on, it says, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards 
shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoke furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now we can see that here God was already talking to Abraham about that exodus. And nevertheless, Abraham's seed, which would come out in that exodus, was still in Abraham's loins. Abraham did not have children yet. He did not even have Ishmael, and much less Isaac. But notice that God, who knows all things, is already talking to him about the journey that Abraham's seed would go through. That earthly seed and everything through which the earthly seed of Abraham went through then the heavenly seed of Abraham also goes through it later on which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ the elect written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life and what happened with the Hebrew people is then a type and figure of what would happen with the heavenly Israel, with the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, in the midst of the Church of Jesus Christ, we will find the equivalent of the exodus that God carried out among the Hebrew people, where God delivered the Hebrew people with a mighty hand. The mighty hand of God stretched out. Notice, we find the mighty hand of God stretched out, manifesting the divine judgments over Egypt and when we speak about the hand of God stretched out, the mighty and powerful hand of God stretched out over a nation, over a people, over a city, or over a person or a family, we find that the divine judgment falls upon that person, family, city, or nation. And now, the divine judgment was falling upon Egypt once Moses came to Egypt, and God began to tell Moses the things God was going to do, the judgment he was going to bring. And Moses communicated to Pharaoh. He made known to Pharaoh the divine judgment that would come upon Egypt. And Pharaoh thought that would not happen. And however, that is what happened, because God had his mighty hand stretched out over and against the empire of Pharaoh. And now notice how with a mighty hand, with the powerful hand of God, bringing the divine judgment upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh and his people, the Hebrew people were delivered from bondage in Egypt. And now, God led the Hebrew people with a mighty and powerful hand, bringing the divine judgment upon all the other nations that the Hebrew people passed by. And every nation that rose up against the Hebrew people felt the mighty hand of God stretched out. That powerful hand of God stretched out over the different nations that opposed the Hebrew people. Now we can see that when God is delivering his people, the mercy of God is upon his people, but the mighty hand of God stretched out over all those who rise against God's people brings the divine judgment upon those individuals or upon those people. Now, those divine judgments that fell upon Egypt and its king, the Pharaoh, are a type and figure of the divine judgment that will fall at this end time, during the Great Tribulation. At this end time, they will fall upon Pharaoh, who will be the Antichrist, because Pharaoh back then typifies the Antichrist, who will be ruling over the Gentiles' kingdom or empire, which at this end time would be in the feet of iron and clay. Now we can see that at the end time, <clears throat> all those places and nations and generations that had the mighty hand of God stretched out felt the judgment of God upon them because the mighty hand of God stretched out against those nations and generations brought the divine judgment. That is how it was for the antediluvian world. The mighty hand of God was stretched out against the antediluvian world and brought the flood and destroyed them all in the flood. 
we find that also in the time of Moses and Lot, the hand stretched out of God fell upon, was manifested upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And the divine judgment came upon Sodom and Gomorrah at that time. Now we can see how the hand stretched out of God, God's mighty hand stretched out, brings the divine judgment upon nations, people, tongues, and generations. Now, all that divine judgment that fell in different generations upon peoples, nations, and tongues is a type and figure of the divine judgment that will fall at the last day during the Great Tribulation against the empire or kingdom of the beast of the Antichrist, which at the end time will be at the feet of iron and clay. Since that empire or kingdom began back then with the golden head which was the Babylonian Empire of which Nebuchadnezzar was the king. For that reason, at the end time, the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, along with his whole religious and political organization is also called Babylon. Be Why? Because its beginning was in Babylon, the beginning of that Gentile kingdom. The Gentile kingdom had also started back in Genesis in a certain sense with Nimrod, who was the grandson, the son of Cush, and Cush was the son of Ham, one of the sons of Noah. Now we can see how the kingdom of Nimrod was and began there in Babylon and it became the head of that kingdom of Babel, in other words, Babylon. That was where the Tower of Babel was built, right there. And now we find that the Gentiles' kingdom, which begins with King Nebuchadnezzar, is represented in the kingdom of Nimrod in Babylon. And now, the kingdom of the Gentiles, which began with the head of gold, represented in that statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw, also begins in Babylon. And that is why that whole kingdom, in its different stages, can be called Babylon. Although it went through the stage there in Babylon, then in Media and Persia, with the Medes and Persians, the second stage represented in the breast and arms of silver, and the third stage represented in the belly and ties of brass, which pertains to the Greek Empire. And then the legs of iron, which pertain to the Roman Empire, and the feet of iron and clay, which also pertains to the Rome, because they are the feet of iron and clay. Iron represents the Roman Empire, and clay, you will notice, pertains to the kingdom that will give their power and strength to the beast, along with their nation, which we find here in Revelation chapter 17, verse 11 and on, where it says, And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eight, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as king one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Those are the elect of God. They that are with him, in other words, the members of his mystical body of believers who, at the last day, will be in eternal and glorified bodies when the dead in Christ rise and we who are alive are changed. By that time, the number of God's elect in the mystical body of Jesus Christ will have been completed. Now, we can see that this whole divine judgment, that whole struggle and victory that Christ obtains against 
the Antichrist, the beast, and the ten kings, he obtains it because he says, they shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Now notice how he comes. Christ in his coming at the last day comes as Lord of lords and King of kings, and he will overcome the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, and the ten kings who will give their power and strength to the beast. This is also already prophesied in the book of the prophet. Daniel in chapter 2 and verse 30 to 45. Notice what it says here. It says, let us see, let us read a little less. Let us see from verse 27 and on. Chapter 2, verse 27 and on of the book of the prophet Daniel says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers shew unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealed secrets and make it known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thought came unto thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to the pass hereafter. And he that revealed secrets make it known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known to the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hand, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven had given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven had he given unto thine hand, and had made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee, shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now, the head of gold represents the Babylonian kingdom with King Nebuchadnezzar. And then after Nebuchadnezzar and his empire, another kingdom will rise, represented in the breast and arms of silver. And he says, and that is an inferior kingdom, because silver is inferior to gold. What is worth more, a kilo of silver or a kilo of gold? Well, a kilo of gold is worth more, because silver is inferior to gold. And that is how these kingdoms have been. The one of Nebuchadnezzar was the superior kingdom among the Gentiles. Then the Medo Persian kingdom was inferior. And after the Medo Persian kingdom represented in the breast and arms of silver, another third kingdom of brass, we shall bear rule over all the earth. That was the Greek Empire which was inferior to silver, because between a kilo of silver and a kilo of brass, which is worth more? Well, the kilo of silver. And that is how it's been with this kingdom. As they have been coming down from the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, 
Then the Belium Tides of Brass, which is the Greek Empire, as they have been going down, they have also been diminishing in quality, decreasing in importance, because they are inferior kingdoms, inferior stages of the kingdoms of the Gentiles as a stage emerges. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdue all things, and as iron that breaketh all this shall it break in pieces and bruise. And that was the Roman Empire of the Caesars. And now, between a kilo of iron and a kilo of brass, which is worth more? Well, a kilo of brass. It is superior. And after this Roman Empire of the Caesars, the feet of iron and the toes of iron and of clay they represent the fact that the Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire, keeps going down all the way to the feet and to the toes. And it is not covered with flesh, rather it is covered with clay. And that is the union of these ten kings who will give their power and strength to the beast. There the beast represents the iron, and the clay represents those kings which will give their power and strength to the beast. And there, we can see how, at this end time, the Gentile kingdom would be in its most critical stage. And that is why the kingdom of the Gentiles has more problems every day. Economic problems, social problems, political problems, military problems. The Gentile kingdom has all kinds of problems in the field of iron and clay. And now, it says, And whereas thou sowest the feet of toes, part of potter clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be... And whereas thou sowest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sowest the iron mixed with merry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sowest iron mixed with merry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, by covenant. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all this kingdom, and it shall stand forever. That is none other than the mighty hand of God stretched out over the Gentile kingdom or empire, as it was stretched out over the empire of Pharaoh in Egypt. For as much as thou sowest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hand, and that he break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. That stone cut out without hands is the white stone that comes with a new name written which no man understood in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. It is the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ at this end time is that white stone. It is that stone cut out without hand that will be present at this end time in the stage of the feet part of iron and part of clay of the Gentile kingdom. But God's kingdom will be in which stage at this end time? The Gentile's kingdom began from the head down, but the kingdom of God began from the bottom up. And at this end time, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be in the stage of the head of gold of the kingdom of God. Therefore, it is the most glorious stage of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, where, just like in the golden stage of King Nebuchadnezzar, the golden stage of the Gentile kingdom there in Babylon, the Pharaoh, or king, 
of the empire there in Babylon, which was Nebuchadnezzar. The prophet Daniel says by the word of God that he was king of kings. And now, in the stage of the head of God of the kingdom of God, which is the stage of the age of the cornerstone, Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. Now we can see why. Christ will obtain the victory against the kingdom of the Gentiles, against the kingdom, the empire of the beast, which at the last day will be in the stage of the feet of iron and clay. And now, how does the stone cut out without hand come, which is the second coming of Christ, the coming of the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, who will stretch out his mighty hand over the empire or kingdom of the Antichrist? It is very important to know how he comes, because if we know how he comes, then we will be waiting for him in that way, and we will see him in, manifested in his coming at this last day, because at this end time is that the life, who is Christ, and death, who is the Antichrist, will be face to face. The beast, along with the ten kings, will rise against the second coming of Christ, but Christ will overcome him. Why? Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. Now let us see, on page 312 of the book of the Revelation of the Seventh Seal, the forerunner of the second coming of Christ says, For a pale horse, in all the words, that pale horse of Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 to 8, who is the Antichrist coming at the last day, eternal separation from God. Again, four, see, oh my. And now, let's see something very important on page 310, where it says, here we see life and death coming to the final struggle. The white horse of true life, that is the white horse of Revelation 19. The pale horse of mixed creed. They see the thing coming to the, to the real showdown. And now, in the coming of the white horse rider of Revelation 19, which is the coming of Christ, the angel of the covenant, he comes with a name which no man understood. It is the coming of the Holy Spirit of the Angel of the Covenant at the last day. But now, how will he come? On page 151 to 152, paragraph 283 to 285, the book of the seals, the forerunner of the second coming of Christ says, and Jesus, his name on earth was Redeemer Jesus. When he was on earth, he was the Redeemer, that's true. But when he conquered death and hell and overcome them and ascended on high, he received a new name. That's the reason you holler the way they do and they don't get nothing. It will be revealed in the thunder. Uh-huh, see. Notice the mysteries. He is coming riding. There's got to be something to change this church. You know that. There's got to be something. Notice, no man know it but himself. Now notice, no man know it but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Oh my, notice. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth go a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. This sharp sword is the Word. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 13 to 16. There comes the Messiah. There he is. And now, notice, there comes the Messiah, in other words, the Anointed One. And further down on page 152, it says, But Christ is called the Word of God. That's what he is. He is called that. Now he's got a name that no man knows, but he's called the Word of God.
And on page 154 to 155 of the Book of the Seals, it says, Glory notice, and when this Holy Spirit that we have becomes incarnate to us, the one that's in our midst now in the form of the Holy Ghost becomes incarnate to us in the person of Jesus Christ, will crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now on page 295, let us see what the coming of that white horse rider of Revelation 19 is. It says, But when our Lord appears here on earth, He'll be riding on a snow white horse, and He'll be completely, fully the Emono, the Word of God incarnate in a man. And if we find that man, we would have found the Word, the Angel of the Covenant, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit manifested in human flesh, veiled in human flesh, and revealed through human flesh, just as it happened with the manifestation of God in Jesus. It was the Word made flesh in that simple young man from Nazareth called Jesus. But some people could not understand it. However, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among the human beings 2,000 years ago in that veil of flesh called Jesus. And at this end time, in Revelation chapter 19, we see that white horse rider of Revelation 19, whose name is called the Word of God. It is the coming of the Word of God again. It is the coming of the Angel of the Covenant, the Angel of the Lord, coming in human flesh at the last day. That will be the Word, the Word incarnate in a man. If we find that man, who is the Angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be seeing the Word, the Word made flesh in the Angel Messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ at this last day. And we will be seeing the work that Christ, the angel of the covenant, will be carrying out through his angel messenger. And through his angel messenger, Jesus Christ will be making known to us all these things which must shortly be done. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says, Come up hither. With the voice of the trumpet, he says, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And where will we go up to? We will go up to the age of the cornerstone, where is where the angel of the covenant will be veiled and revealed through his angel messenger at this last day. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 tells us, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord, God of the holy prophets, sent his angel, whom has he sent? His angel messenger, to shew unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Why has he sent him for? To show his servants the things which must shortly be done. No one will be able to understand the things that will be happening at this end time unless it is through the message of Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, through his angel messenger. Because through his angel messenger, is that all these things which must surely be done are made known. That is why the angel messenger of Jesus Christ will be in the age of the cornerstone. And Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, the Holy Spirit, will be manifested in him in human flesh, in his angel messenger. And through his angel messenger, he will be making known to us all these things which must surely be done at this end time. Notice a simple way we can understand all these things. It is not by being very intelligent or going to study to obtain a great doctorate in theology. However, it is by hearing the voice of Christ, the angel of the covenant, through his angel messenger, through whom he will be making known to us all these things which must shortly be done at this end time. That is why also Revelation chapter 22 verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. The angel of Jesus Christ is sent to testify in and to all the churches, and mainly to the church of Jesus Christ, the mystical body of Christ, to the elect of God of the last day, whom will be in the age of the cornerstone. They are the first ones who receive the message, and their understanding is open. And then they say, this is what I was waiting for. I can truly understand these things. Why? Because God opens their heart 
and their understanding so that they may understand all these prophecies which must be fulfilled at this end time. And thus he opens the scripture to us through the message of the gospel of the kingdom, through his angel messenger. And in the messages or conferences preached by the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will find all the answers to all our questions that we have related to the things mentioned in the book of Revelation, which are contained in those symbols of the book of Revelation, and also in the book of the prophet Daniel, where we find many symbols that are repeated in the book of Revelation. Now notice how at this end time, the revelation of all the things which must happen, they come to the sons and daughters of God through the manifestation of Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit through His angel messenger. And therefore, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the age of the cornerstone, the Golden Age, obtains all that revelation, and thus she obtains all the blessings of these things which God would be doing at this end time. And we will be seeing how Christ will be pouring out His blessings upon all of us by the creative word being spoken as a blessing to all of us. But then, the creative word of God will be spoken and it will reveal the divine judgment that will come upon the earth because God will be revealing to his angel messenger all this divine judgment that will come upon the earth and the angel will be making them known to the human race and they will be fulfilled according to how they will be made known. Just like when Moses made known the divine judgment that will fall upon Egypt one by one, he made them known. And as he was making them known, he said, this will come upon Egypt. And it came. Likewise, the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ will be making known by the Spirit of God all this divine judgment that will come upon the Gentile kingdom. And each one of them will be fulfilled. The one who will be bringing this judgment will be God with a mighty hand stretched out over the empire or kingdom of the beast during the Great Tribulation. Now we can see that God's hand stretched out over and against the empire of the beast will bring the divine judgments. In the book of Revelation, chapter 6, Verse 12 and on, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell on to the earth, even as a fig tree casted her on timely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven disparted as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the king of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand the time of God's wrath of the great tribulation you will notice that time is presented here as well as the divine judgment that will be falling upon mankind also in the book of Revelation chapter 11 from verse 15 and on we find another phase or we find the divine judgment on earth from another point of view or from another angle Chapter 11, verse 15 and on of the book of Revelation says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, 
fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now we can see how, from the throne of God in heaven, the divine judgment is spoken by God from his throne so that it may fall on earth, because the high priest, Jesus Christ, is no longer there with his sacrifice on the throne or seat of mercy. Because when Christ, with his sacrifice, leaves the throne of intercession in heaven, that throne, which is the throne of God, becomes a throne of judgment for God to execute the judgment from his throne and for that judgment to be materialized here on earth. But the Lord God will do nothing without first revealing his secrets to his servants, his prophets. From stage to stage, from age to age, and from dispensation unto dispensation, God has been revealing his secrets to his servants, his prophets. And at this end time, the things that God will be doing and speaking from his throne will be received by the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he will be receiving that revelation and he will be making it known to mankind. First to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and then to all those who live on the face of the earth. Now we can see how this divine judgment that will fall upon the earth will be known through the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be like the transmitter with its speakers, making known what God is speaking from the throne. But it is transmitted to this planet Earth through the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like a radio or television station from a certain place where it has its offices and broadcast studio where it has their equipment. From there, they broadcast or transmit live or recorded programs. And then, through a television system, you tune in to the desired channel and you see and hear what is being broadcasted or transmitted from the broadcast studio of that television channel. Thus also, through the television of God, the television of God has always been a prophet who sees in another dimension and brings it to this earthly dimension. Through the television of God, God will be transmitted from heaven, his favorite program for this end time. And the program that God will be broadcasting is here in the Bible. And whosoever wants to see and hear God's favorite program will see it and hear it through the television of God, who will be the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we will hear the voice of Christ, the voice of God, being transmitted to the human race and making known the things which must come to pass at this time. And through his television, God will be showing his entire program for the same time, God's programming for the last day. So, by tuning in to God's eight channel, in other words, the eighth age, the age of the cornerstone, in that channel of God, the entire program of God pertaining to this end time will be broadcasted. Likewise, God's program pertaining to the first age was broadcasted in the television called Paul. 
tuned in to the first age and we could say to the first channel and so on from age to age each age being God's channel and the messenger being the television through that manifestation of God through his television in the pertaining channel in each age, God broadcasted his program for each age. The programming from heaven was broadcasted to the human race in each age through the television, God's messenger for each age. And now, God will be broadcasting in the age of the cornerstone, which would be like a God's eight channel. And through God's television, the angel messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. There we have God's television. And now you will notice how everything is simple. When a person wants to watch, wants to watch a certain program that will be broadcasted, at a certain hour of the day or of the night, you tune in to the right channel on your television, and there you have that program. But if you tune in to another channel, you cannot expect to see the program you want it to see. You will be watching a different program. That is also how it's been from age to age. That is how it is for our time at this end time. All of God's program is transmitted to the human race and especially to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom through his angel messenger. Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 and Revelation chapter 22 verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to shew unto his servants the things which must come to pass, in other words, which must shortly be done. How are we going to see, understand, and hear the things which must shortly be done at this end time? Through the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who at this end time will be making known all these things in the church of Jesus Christ in the age of the cornerstone. Now, you notice how simple everything is? It is so simple that even the children can see it, can understand it, and can testify what they are seeing, what they are understanding in God's program. And now, we see the mercy of God extended upon His church at this end time. But then, the mighty hand of God will be stretched out over the kingdom of the beast and bring the divine judgments of the great tribulation. But before that, we will be changed. The dead in Christ will be raised and we will all have a glorified and eternal body, just like the body of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And we will go with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. So, continue forward serving our beloved Lord Jesus Christ and being prepared to be changed and raptured at this end time in which we are living in. Soon, the dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive will be changed. It is a promise of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And it is for the elect of the age of the cornerstone, for the elect of the golden age, which is the age that connects to heaven, that connects to eternity, because it is an eternal age. And that is why we will also go into eternity physically as well. And our age is the age that is adopted at this end time. And the ones who will, will be in that age will be adopted. Their bodies will be changed and we will all be to the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. This is also the age where the mighty hand of God will be stretched out over the kingdom of the Antichrist, the kingdom of the beast at this end time. But the kingdom of God will prevail and Christ 
will obtain the great victory in love divine for his church at this end time. The mighty hand of God stretched out. We have seen the divine judgment that will come. That is the mighty hand of God stretched out over the kingdom of the Gentiles. But for us, it is extended in mercy and love divine before he leaves the throne of intercession. And once we are changed, no divine judgment will be able to touch our physical body because it is an eternal and glorified physical body which can neither get sick nor can be destroyed nor can die but rather it is an eternal and glorified body just like the body of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ that is the body he has promised for each one of you and also for me and he that endures to the end shall be saved in other words he will be changed and be to the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. It has been a great privilege for me to be with you, showing you this subject, the mighty hand of God stretched out. And where are those who would see the mighty hand of God stretched out? Here we are, in this place in Mexico. And in all of the Mexican Republic, there are thousands of people whom were predestinated to see the mighty hand of God stretched out. But before it, it is stretched out in divine judgment over the human race, it is stretched out over us in mercy and love divine. In order to be called, gathered together and prepared to be changed and raptured at this end time. May the mercy of God the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, be manifested upon each one of you and upon myself. And soon may we all be changed and taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. In the eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. May God continue to bless you all. May God keep you. And I leave the Reverend Miguel Bermudez Martin with us again to continue and conclude our participation in this evening. May God bless you and keep you all.